So we have a session today where a CIO uh, on a fireside chat with a fellow CIO. So we have Dijendra Sivatsa, whom we lovingly call as a DJ, uh, interviewing uh, Manish Dangi, a rock star, uh, about, about uh, DJ. DJ is a chief investment officer at uh, Sundaram Mutual Fund. He's a CFA charter holder. He holds BTEC uh, in textile technology from the Technological Institute of Textiles and Sciences and a PGDM from Goa Institute of Management. He has over two decades of experience uh, and uh, with most of them in the financial services industry. Off to you, DJ. Hi, uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Vijay. I think uh, uh, we are very delighted to have uh, Manish on this platform on the India CFA Society Fixed Income Summit. I think he, Manish doesn't need an introduction. I mean, I think he has been a star performer and there in the market for more than two decades. And uh, he's worked as uh, CIO in Aditya Birla Sun Life. Uh, manage more than 25 billion US dollar assets and uh, he's been uh, awarded multiple uh, awards over the years and one of the most uh, uh, astute uh, minds in the industry. I think uh, it is my pleasure to uh, pick on his brain today and ask him certain things in the market, what is going on, what is the macro background and what he has been speaking about. Now he runs uh, an investment firm on his, on his own, uh, MDIS, if I'm not wrong. And I think uh, um, I can straight away, without uh, taking too much of time, I would like to get into asking Manish some questions which uh, our uh, uh, listeners are keen to hear. So Manish, uh, uh, without getting delaying too much, I mean, want to send, set the context in terms of the growth, inflation, liquidity framework, which is currently the uh, backdrop in the markets today. And if you look at uh, uh, where the growth is added, so we have we've just seen that the growth is not picked up to that extent. There have been supply disruptions, inflation is moving higher. And we have just seen the central banks globally have started pulling out the accommodation which they had uh, provided into the market. So from that perspective, what do you see in the markets today in terms of this growth, inflation, and liquidity framework? I mean, the kind of liquidity which was pumped in post-pandemic, and it was there, always there in the market, but it was being withdrawn. This kind of liquidity, which has been there in from, say, a G3 balance sheet size of close to about $29 trillion. Uh, so that kind of liquidity, when we are looking at, what do you think that how it, will the market let that liquidity will be with, uh, liquidity be withdrawn? in the current context or at some point in time that could be challenged at this point in time. Right now, it looks like that uh, um, the, the central banks are having uh, 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 hots for the inflation currently. So clearly they are looking to withdraw the liquidity. They are looking to normalize the process, but to what extent is something which I think the street is wondering right now. Over to you, Manish. Yeah, thanks, DJ. Let uh, me talk to you. Uh, so, I, I, see, firstly, my prognosis for global growth is that it will mean revert to what we've seen over the last 20 years, which is you sort of, I, if I were to um, sort of adjust it to uh, the size of the economies, the global growth would be about somewhere between 35 to 4%, which has been what we've seen over the last two decades. And there is a there is some risk to the downward surprise, though we are decelerating at this stage from uh, sort of being uh, rapidly growing global economy. So it's only um, for asset markets it's a big deal that it's decelerating, and you know at least in my view, by the middle of the year, I think the growing narrative in the system, you know, particularly for the risk markets would be that there'll be a growth scare of sorts. So in a sense, you know, DJ, what I think is that there's going to be a transition from inflation scare that market 
and to a certain extent now that you've heard fed markets are gripped with um i think the transition will happen to growth scare and uh, that is is from a policy setup point of view uh is very meaningful uh now why i think that there will be a growth scare is only because is only because i think the post gfc world which has been you know what we've identified is that at least the developed world is has aged a lot and its debt levels have risen a lot that until they in the network of economies and the systems policy support is in play uh you get reasonable growth uh which is of course far lesser than what we had in north east and uh, before that but the moment it is withdrawn uh the growth surprisingly miraculously begin to decelerate and of course you know asset markets begin to pew so the setup that i'm thinking at least from a global point of view dj is that i see uh, uh i see sort of us which is a significant part of world economy and is most important for asset market uh slowing and but yet doing much better than uh, most other economies in the world Europe, Japan, rest of the OECD actually sort of again slowing, but better than what they have done in last couple of years, but more like what they have done in last twenty years. And emerging market is what I think would behave, and that's my counter view uh, to many sell side uh, folks who sort of have been talking up emerging markets. I think there is going to be a significant slowdown. I think emerging markets are pretty sick right now. uh and in absence of uh sort of a unsatiating a demand from us consumer and in absence of exports uh, sort of stimulus uh, given that they could not do a lot of fiscal um stimulus and their household balance sheets are still scarred dj i think that you know uh we are going to witness sort of Uh, many uh, not many turkeys of the sorts but you know many uh, many accidents in emerging markets so i don't think when we look back you know in december 2022 uh, we would be we would be uh, as drunk as we are you know today where almost commonly held belief as if you know that world has reclaimed its uh, peak and you know is now out there to sort of grow forever at 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 a faster clip than you know what it's done post gfc i think there's going to be a fair bit of disappointment so okay i mean i'll just pause here but my key narrative that i am making in that see in the end in market you only make money if you can price the narrative of the market ahead of markets and i think dj in 3 to 6 months time the dominant narrative in the market is going to be slowing growth and uh, and uh, more importantly from a, and i think we should discuss this in detail but more importantly markets figuring out that uh, policy makers are unwilling to support um the the fading growth simply because you know they delayed the normalization um so much that inflation has appeared on the horizon pretty much across the world and uh, because inflation is a lagging indicator remember because you know while the growth will slow inflation would continue to be there on the horizon for next 6 8 months and that would mean that you know there'll be binding constraints for uh, central bankers more specifically fed but generally across central bankers including india that we should discuss in detail perhaps that you know they will not react to the fading growth and which in a sense is a is a setup that i am i am i i am of the view that you know markets won't like fixed income perhaps would like of course you know which is what you know the flattening curves are telling you um, but uh, equity folks won't like this and industrial commodities won't like it so yeah so they, they, this is the way sort of a big picture thinking i am having right now so uh, taking from what you have been uh, you have just uh, spoken uh, manish i mean i think you are you are you are scared that uh, the emerging markets will not do as well as what uh, the market is thinking right now so that's a contra way which you, and this is definitely the street view right now that emerging markets are going to do well going yes. forward because they are going to grow faster than the developed world and they are going to be better off going forward and that they are less scarred because they have built up buffers into their economy 
So all these things we have heard in, in fact, a lot of praise on India has been heaped in terms of the forex reserves, which India has built up and it is kind of act, going to act like a buffer when the reverse reversal happens. But I think, uh, don't you think, I mean, coming to India, obviously, because we are in India and we would like to know what uh, Indian Central Bank would do probably. So uh, from a market perspective, what we are reading right now is, I mean, clearly the Central Bank is looking to delay the normalization process. And uh, right now, the uh, and, and to a certain extent, they are right also. If you look at it, the negative output gap has been there. We have not seen a durable uh, uh, growth back into the market. But the inflation scare is for real, no doubt about it, because we have seen the supply disruption, whatever uh, we, can, we can build into it. India uh, may be looking to uh, uh, fight this out. I think uh, one of the major places where India escaped, uh, I think, would be uh, the food uh, buffer stock which India had. Probably the food inflation was not that severe as it was in various other economies. So on that uh, uh, setup, what do you think that uh, probably the R Central Bank is going to do going forward? Is it is it going to bite the bullet or is it going to uh, remain where it is and try to delay the cycle as far as possible see the dj the the problem of delaying normalization is as follows that while it is all right if your base case plays out but then it constrains you just in case the alternate uh, view uh, begins to emerge as the emergent one and my my fear and for fed also i made the same point for the last many months that it's not that the economy or inflation required uh, rate tightening but the normalization would have brought us uh, optionality to act in case an alternate uh, view begins to sort of play out which is sort of slowing economy exactly what happened in 2019 and in india too sort of so far so good, you know, I've been, I've been actually chairing RBI for what they've been doing. And I've been extremely critical of RBI, uh, you know, under the predecessor of this governor and even under Rajan, so, so to say, because they were far too rigid. They impose far too much of real rates on economy, precisely when we were going through deleveraging cycle. So, but nonetheless, at this stage, given that the global macro setup is beginning to sort of hint at uh, a situation where inflation is more durable uh, than what one would want it to be and the chief anchor of you know your policy rate is is you know us fed you know which who itself has repivoted to tightening bias now the degrees of freedom available to indian central bank are extraordinarily limited you know you you seeing what's happening in turkey you know that you know basically more the market demands rate hike if you do the reverse it actually pinches you more i mean of course that's like a basket case and a at, at, at an exterior and of course is not likely to play out in any form and substance in india but nonetheless it's a test case of you know what exactly uh, you know, doing policy, inverted policy, so to say, versus what is demanded by the macro setup. So the macro setup is that you have current account deficit widening at now run rate of 3%. You have average of 6% inflation over last two years. So right at the top of the band that you've, you, you sort of set out yourself for, uh, for the inflation mandate. You have breathed. We hold you the, there, Manish, uh, on the on the uh, inflation setup. So, if we try to compare India with uh, the other global economies, so for example, all other economies they have their forms of targeting inflation. That's fine, but the uh, the headline inflation, which is in in the developed economies, is around two percent. Okay, which is running close to about in eurozone about five percent, in about seven percent in US and uh, uk maybe again five percent so the point is that in eurozone it's roughly about five seven so it is way higher than what they have set it up in india if you look at it the range is two to six and we are targeting a median of four and we are still in that range right now so don't you see that there is an opportunity with rbi 
not to act in a hurry yeah it's just that we we all know that you know us is the only sovereign actually in terms of monetary policy setting and to a certain extent of course europe and all the developed countries and you know irrespective of how prudent that you have been you you're not given given the degrees of freedom that these folks have and given that a very large part of risk capital you know come to india from outside you know the very contract that you have with the outside capital is that you shall deliver a reasonable real rate you cannot breach it us can breach it until it, because it's a hegemony right in the in the monetary policy system of the world and that per, perhaps is the reason why they get out of the mess uh, as quickly as they do almost every time you know even in the gfc they were at the they were the epicenter of uh you know the mess that they created the world i mean when there's the system and yet they got out of it pretty quickly and you had a double dip in in india and europe and so and so forth right so i mean what what gets them and secures them something is something else altogether and you know we don't have those degrees of freedom we have to get aligned otherwise uh you know external capital will begin to desert us also as i said at the current level of rates it's not like china where where what do you call it the economy is able to sort of supply uh, services and goods to its people and yet sort of export it out to the world so in a sense at lowish rate china and many asians are actually exporting capital whereas what has played out in india is that in last two years we have had a sustained rise in current account deficit now hitting a 3% cat so in a sense we are st- starting to become a big importer of capital again in a substantial manner for in, even for our livelihoods of, of the sorts okay so ab half a percent current account deficit swinging to 3% is essentially what it's basically that you know we are consuming about 3% more okay and so, about so, so on that dot account about 2.5% uh, Two and a half percent more than what we were doing one and a half year uh, uh, ago. So to that extent, the degrees of freedom are limited to our uh, policy setting. We will have to otherwise, DJ. We, you remember 2011-13 that Subaru's regime also depressed the real rate in the in the fear that you know GFC had played out and that was once in a century crisis and India needed to heal and therefore they kept the rates too low for long. Very quickly, it transformed in, itself into a what do you call it uh, a cat crisis for us resulting in a we becoming the fragile five in 2013 isn't it so now the key learning of 2009 11 episode is as follows as far as the country is concerned never run large fiscal uh, sort of deficits because if you do and stimulate the economy excessively there is no unwind possible for you always and always like in 80s and 90s and 2008s it always converts into bop crisis for our country don't do that and second thing is in 2009 11 another learning that we had is that do not depress rate for too long at least relative to our cousins especially emerging markets if not the dms because if you do that it will convert into a currency crisis for you so which is why i think while all the points that you said then you know dekho hum See, a rich man can afford lot of sins. Poor can't. Unfortunately, we are poor in the in the in the global setup that we live in. We, as as I said, and the cost of repeating it, uh, sounding repetitive, we do not have the sovereignty over our monetary policy. On that count, uh, like we just wanted to ask. So, uh, what views you hold on the? index inclusion so when i'm bringing that point out here because it, it is very relevant at this point in time because uh, both in terms of the liquidity what rbi could do so i mean what is also your uh, thoughts on in terms of so there has been a lot of uh, sell side report which say that 30 40 billion dollars will be attracted once the index inclusion happens that kind of money is the gap which we are seeing so probably this money also uh, uh, a corollary to that would be that uh, uh, we we never run in the past also as you are pointing about to history and you are taking a leaf out of the history books uh, from from the monetary perspective so the point is that even in india if you look at it uh, whenever we uh, run fiscal deficit higher fiscal deficit they don't go away immediately so we have started running a higher fiscal deficit at about almost 7% uh, 
in this uh, 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 fiscal probably it will remain there for some time it will maybe in a percentage band here and there and running that kind of a high fiscal deficit obviously which means that uh, huge amount of uh, inflation scare could happen going forward so when i think that is something which uh, comes to my mind when what you have been speaking about also to put in that context could you also talk about that what you think will be a primary supply from the uh, government of india to these uh, uh, foreign bond holders probably if they look to invest or are they already invested to a certain extent or are they looking to uh, uh, they will under underweight india or what what are your thoughts on that see dj again the two things you know we we have stopped getting money from firangis in fixed income market for 5 6 years money doesn't come to us anymore the day the currency play stopped uh we stopped getting money okay because india intrinsically does not offer high real yield uh less so even today india has fiscal dominance as far as its rate architecture is concerned that there is far too much supply so therefore the 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 space for major rally in bond market even in a ugly growth setup is somewhat limited and and it in in short windows because you've been there in the market for long enough you know wonderful years that we used to have during 2001 2 3 how quickly and for how long rates will continue to rally and you know we were all drunk um you know enjoying the big rallies that we had it's been very long that we don't have any more such rallies and there are reasons for it but then you know firangis still used to come in in india until 2014 15 because india provided sort of because of our currency mismanagement we provided opportunities of squeezes okay and a quick buck sometimes because you know because invariably the rate play also has embedded currency play in it and uh, if you think that there is a big tide of money coming your shore it would result in a relatively you know rbi under subarav and many others used to be that okay money is coming in let the currency float on its own or almost ideologically and that resulted in lot of arbitrage flow coming in the country not just to play rates but also in intrinsically play currency that doesn't happen any more uh, after 2015 16 so we've sort of learned that trick that we don't want it and which is why i think the proof of whether a lot of excitement would be there in the markets as far as uh, bonds are concerned for firangis and foreigners answer to that is perhaps no because we have already seen that they are not excited about it there is something inherently wrong in our market systems that this, that does not attract that attracts lot of equity but does not attract you know uh, participation on the bond side so this is how i would think that you no know, while and this is also a little bit of patchwork dj as to one you know as a matter of fact that you know you are sitting on large amount of uh, reserves okay why on earth would you want at this stage to sort of have foreigners come and you know eat into the the excess spread that you offer versus the rest of the world treasuries you don't however amount of money that you have ought to create you know whether the foreigner is giving or rbi is giving through monetization is for the system it's same so i think you know at least in delhi what i hear dj is that there is a lot of ideological orthodoxy against this idea of you know having foreigners participate okay i agree that there is this big move towards you know uh, getting it in, included but there is a parallel a uh, what do you call very dominant orthodoxy that let us not have these foreigners come in our bond market because that's precisely been the reason why we have saved ourselves from recurrent uh, bop led crisis you know that emerging markets have faced okay that's my, so, uh, another question to you on that count because i think uh, that's one of the major concerns which could probably happen if you see that index inclusion happening at some point in time even uh, our central bank could lose control over the pricing of the government bond yields absolutely and they are aware of it since you also know folks in rbi they are aware of it and therefore they are just far too smart to allow foreigners to dominate like indonesia and therefore they will do a patchwork as i said they will allow a let's say about half a percent or a 1% of gdp over a period of couple of years or 3% of gdp in like 5 years 
in a, a country which runs almost 10% fiscal deficit you know between states and and uh, center and has absolutely no saving to supply that sort of duration to the government you know which is out there to borrow you know and because we all want to borrow the, this country wants to unlike uk us you know i mean particularly us it doesn't borrow 3 4 year points it borrows a 10 year where is that duration in an emerging market you can't have 10 year duration liability um, or a sort of assets in the households so in a sense there is a perfect mismatch between is it real estate a place where it could it could provide that kind of uh, a duration come again come again so real estate is one place where we, we are under owned in on the housing uh, sector so real estate we we do we as a percentage of gdp it's a very low uh, uh, fund uh, borrowing liability profile on the household side but the point is that uh, couldn't that be the duration supplier that no, uh, real estate is an asset as yeah. as is government bond we are bothered about the liability the pension funds and the insurance firms you know to the extent you know they do they offer liability of a longest term and duration but the banks you know where who we have been primarily dependent upon to sort of get supplied on the government bond they don't have the sort of duration they have a the the marginal deposit of a bank is of one and a half year you cannot have them buy 10 20 year bonds and if you have then you have to you ought to give them the stm protection okay but then we are getting into the territory that you know we wanted to get rid of which is called banking reform that okay let only lcr which is that the boards decide what to do in terms of asset allocation and management of liquidity instead of slr which is a very archaic idea so to that extent i think i i i think india for traditionally has been stuck in this fiscal mess origin of that is in 1980s unfortunately nothing much of course pandemic you couldn't have done much and one has to actually one has to actually applaud the government to the extent that they turned out to be as conservative as they were you know few in the world actually turned out to be as conservative in terms of fiscal uh, play again because the ideas of both 80s 90s and most importantly 2008s crisis uh, outcome was stitched on their mind and which is why they didn't go for a full fiscal play so okay the okay in nutshell in substance what i think is that the the dj the supply is so dominant that the 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 rates in india unfortunately are not growth plays they are they, they are fiscal plays and intermittently when growth becomes so ugly that central bank has no alternative but to actually interfere in the rate markets by doing direct purchases is when rate markets react so indian rate market is perhaps the last one to react uh, and therefore uh, it, which is perhaps the reason why since 2015 the arbitrageers don't come to india anymore because you know they know that okay pehle us mein bana lenge paisa uske baad mein central bank will wake up here they'll come and interfere in the markets do lots of worm or first people will be dismissive of it and then eventually you know when they sort of pile on a, pile on it is when we will also enter make quick buck and get out but that's a very short window of place so to say okay i think uh, let's uh, change tracks now and uh, <laughs> and understand from you uh, about the credit markets credit markets in india uh are quite uh, so people have been dismissive about the credit markets if you in from an investment perspective also people haven't had a very good experience particularly in the mutual fund space we had seen that some credit events caused the uh, dislocation of the market and because of that the investors just turned their back onto the credit products so from that perspective my, i have two questions for you one question is obviously that is mf platform a good platform to do credit when there are many other platforms available to do credit that is number one the other question which is that what is from your perspective or how do you see the uh, credit markets or credit uh, play in india going forward man obviously it is likely to develop but how fast that's my question so this we, is again, again again before uh, you answer on that the other point is that we have clearly seen even in this uh, cycle also we have clearly seen the triple a's have benefit okay we have not seen the benefit of these rates or the liquidity which is so huge into the system did not finally go down to the 
lower rated uh, one so if you even if you say triple a double a plus could have probably benefited but at double a minus onwards we couldn't see any benefit occurring to that extent where the rate cycle had delivered and the transmission was much much poorer on the double a minus and below so that's that's something which, which is which is the place where the it's most needed so i mean i think that's the that's the question which i have for you so dj i mean if once we begin to think of credit it invariably we talking of double a and below you know so the problem of that space is that it is one inherently illiquid but that is true for all financial instruments you know the problem of all financial instrument you and i know is that while they offer this uh, this idea of liquidity exist in financial instrument but that is only when you only want to liquidate and you're not part of the system which in entirety wants to liquidate moment the whole of system wants to liquidate something the liquidity disappears walls go up and bidas widen and liquidity disappear and which is why you see these drawdowns in equity markets bond markets credit markets recurrently um in across sort of territories so firstly the problem with anything such as credit is that it's a financial instrument and it is bound to be extraordinarily liquid every time systemic crisis plays out now in credit you know there is another problem and that you know and i i'll get to the answer as to what can mf do this but then there is another problem that refinancing risk for an inferior credit which is triple b and a is is converts into business risk every time systemic crisis plays out now that's an important thing to understand that doesn't play out in equity because it's a residual uh, claim so no one bothers if the stock is down by 90% you cannot present the claim to the balance sheet but in in credit the bal the balance sheet is presented with a claim that i want my money back precisely when our balance sheet is run out of money for governance and for variety of reasons and therefore in that setup no one else is wanting to refinance you and therefore refinance itself converts into a business risk and which is why you know we've seen many firms which had very low leverage actually turning themselves into uh, you know or becoming bankrupt of sorts because uh, in 2018 20 you know there was no one out there to refinance so these are the two big things you know one the financial instruments per se are illiquid for the because they they sort of uh, offer something that they cannot offer they can only offer liquidity for personal emergency not for the systemic emergency so to say whereas most of the withdrawals from financial instrument happen when there are systemic emergencies you know like gfc cycle like covid that's when everyone wants to get out but they can't offer and second is that it it happens in equity but it does not affect the balance sheet of the firm but it does affect the balance sheet of firm in the case of credit because the refinance risk or the claims on the balance sheet convert in, convert themselves into business risk now in that setup dj it's impossible to run these exposures in hindsight that i can now tell on mutual funds because unless mutual funds are offering patient capital which basically means that they should be able to sustain the depressing sort of setup that they live in where credits are deteriorating and yet they sort of elongate the maturity give them sort of uh, an excess time to sort of you know return money to them and sometimes actually load more on the balance sheet and give them more just in case they require just to ensure that the firm survive all of these perhaps were possible with the psu banks our much less possible in private banks and now in entirety not possible and with mutual fund it's almost impossible in open ended uh, funds it's actually evil uh, is how i have understood this and said so to that extent i think it is extremely difficult to imagine that on open ended platforms you know you will be able to do credit of course there can be you know ways to sort of deal with it you can just to clarify NP. for the benefit of the listeners i mean credit you mean something double a and below double a and below 
local okay. currency double and below so so basically where the liquidity is not so great absolutely so the basically credit equity all the financial instruments which inherently offer higher risk premium they offer so because they go through emergencies more frequently than the triple a's and government bonds right but then yeah, yeah. precisely in those emergent times when things are looking bad you know everyone wants to withdraw and that can actually convert them uh, convert at least in the case of credit you know uh, bankruptcy so so it's it's untenable i would say uh, the, the, uh, then you know so do you can still do it in a in a close ended structures uh, you have to have a patient capital it is not a retail product it's an institutional product just it perverts that you know most retail most of the credit that we have done actually in india at least on mf platform has been retail it is actually a pure institutional stuff you know which which perhaps would understand that okay in this setup you know we need not withdraw money because see if everyone is patient enough you know you may very, very likely that credit would deliver reasonable return but then you know that's not what is what happens because there is a group think at play right you know everyone wants to get out in april 2020 uh and uh, which which sort of leads to and then same thing plays out in banks also by the way because banks are offering the same uh, are inherently alm plays that pretty much large part of deposits uh, given that everyone now sort of claims to have 50 60% casa that what does it mean it basically is that you know banks balance sheets are so lopsided that without a central bank put no bank irrespective of its governance and risk policies can survive for long because you would meet some accident It, uh, it can be endogenous or exogenous to your balance sheet but you would meet and that means that you would blow up if i'm hearing you right what you are suggesting is that if you want to do these things you have to have a backstop facility Clearly. absolutely which is what us offers the the system in us is you know why did money market fund did not blow up this time and why did junk bond market not us because yeah yeah i agree with you because the tail risk can be price tail risk need to be backstop No it doubt. has to be backstop yeah yeah but That's then there right. are moral hazard to it i don't think society and capitalism as such you know has solved solved this problem because then there is genuinely a moral hazard that who owns mutual fund most of the mutual funds and most of the sort of bonds are owned by one percenters and who owns government and this finances is actually the whole of the country and people and invariably average and poor man why should he backstop you which is perhaps why the capitalism will have to eventually solve this by ensuring that no i mean you can't make the obscene money that you make in financial setups banks or otherwise so uh, so i mean i think again uh, uh, going on uh, to the other question which i have for you so uh, what's your view on the macro investing which you are now taken up as a profession post your uh, leaving the leaving uh, your your fixed income role so what is what are you currently what is this what is the thought process behind this and what is actually macro forecasting and investing on based on macro forecasting is i, I think a very 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 uh, small area as of now i mean i have not heard about it too much i think yeah. it is more to do with the uh, 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 asset allocation kind of thing i mean i don't know so i would like to know more about it Yeah, I mean, I, 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 lest it becomes a marketing platform for me, I'll try and limit it in just one minute. In sure. in in a sense, DJ, what what I'm setting out to do is that that rates, policies, currencies, commodities, all of them are actually tools to understand the broad framework that we live in, and and if you have a grip of all the markets, including the 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 policy biases you are perhaps better positioned to take the uh, take the incremental bet on your portfolio now the way i do it of course for myself dj is that i i play markets you know across from equities to bonds to currency and and try and sort of optimize returns uh for myself so only in, with big drawdowns when i see like in 2009 13 and 20 um i sort of enter equities because 
I look at equity one not as a firm but as a collection of firms, and in aggregate, the kind of equity risk premiums that the markets in aggregate offer. If they turn cheap, I try and get in, especially in a setup when which is reflationary, where the policymakers are supporting it. The day it sort of becomes expensive, as it has become today. For the last three months, I've been arguing this. It, when it becomes expensive, you know, exit and uh, sit on sidelines, sort of waste time in cash or stuff like that. And then, you know, when policymakers err on the other side, where which basically in an inflationary setup and the rates head higher, uh, you know, basically blow your money in interest rates, you know, which is long bonds and stuff like that. And because they turned out to be negative beta when, when, you know, when inflation is high, and you know equity markets begin to melt because they get surprised on the policy side because policy is trying to tame the growth and inflation both together they get surprised and in the late cycle you know equities fall and that is precisely when you actually make money in bonds so in a utopian world uh, and i i'm not offering that to anyone that this is possible but in a utopian world there'll be no year you will not make a lot of money you know but that is what my ask is that, you know, I, I should in some fans, 60, 70, 80% of that I should be able to do, which is play bonds, equity currencies through the cycle and try and optimize returns. But the main objective, the DJ of mine in a macro investing is that somehow I need to ensure that my capital does not experience the drawdown that equity is used to, which is every fifth or 10th year, you know, it has 30, 40, 50% drawdowns. I believe that there are symptoms available to all of us who understand macro well that if we exit positions ahead of those points you know we will experience uh, we won't experience much of drawdown and that is how we will be able to size our positions significantly in the beginning of cy uh, next cycle when the policies becomes more stimulative and and valuations are cheap so so that's the that's what i am doing it for myself I've done it for myself, you know, uh, frankly, over the last 15, 16 years, and I'm hoping to sort of replicate this. It's not an unusual thing to do, by the way, while in India, there is this lot of fanfare of bottom-up investing. I think globally, macro investing is pretty sort of popular. And my sense is that, you know, uh, see, the the past, the, it's, it's becoming near, becoming almost almost negligible probability of outperforming markets through bottom up investing in on large platforms i think you know the thing that i have I, I have done for myself you know i think that we should be able to offer uh, superior returns um, versus markets as such so you if know, i hear you right what you are trying to say is basically you are going to target that asset class in a cycle and focus is beforehand where the largest profit pool lies that's what you are essentially in some saying. sense yes absolutely absolutely yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a very good thing to do. I again mean, in, in a utopian world, I think I would love to do that with my money. Let's see. Okay. And and you say that you have already made that. I'll, I'll soon be taking years. money from uh, people such as you. So. <laughs> no, no, no. Expect a call. Uh, not uh, didn't man mean that. Okay. Uh, so uh, so I mean, other thing which uh, I have in mind is that uh, we have seen this social media investing also catching up quite a bit. Okay, now a lot of people are there on the social media. They are putting their views out there, and people are following them. I mean, how do you see the investment future? Even for everywhere we are, we are looking at it that even in bond, it, it, it's a more prominent in in esoteric. Uh, uh, asset class. Okay, even if you call that as an asset class, I don't know whether you want to call it as an asset class or not because I I only uh, technically feel that it is a means of transmitting money. Okay, but anyway, there are people who are putting money there in cryptos. Okay, which is there being influenced by the social media quite a bit. Similarly, on the equities also, Reddit platform we have read so much about it. Okay, so this social media uh, uh, influencing particularly the youngsters. Okay where they are putting money because probably they have not made money. If you look at it, they did not get a chance to make money. And because of that, is it a way of making obscene amount of money? Is it that is, is that uh, something which is happening or, or what is your thought on that social media investing or is it going to continue or what is the future of social media investing? 
social media industry i mean i i sort of think of uh, twitter and stuff like that you know is basically they're like malls i mean when you go to a mall there are a lot of shops everyone is actually telling you that buy my shoes and clothes because they are the best you ought to listen to them and you ask them five questions as to why your shoes are better than the next shop but you know precisely our heuristics are not that you know just because the shopkeeper is telling you that his shoes are the best you know you end up buying that only you know you ask the next guy and say no it looks more expensive can you give me a little better price and so and so forth so so it's like a, a so i mean twitter and linkedin and stuff like that are there are like you know view shops okay and they are all selling their views you know they appear to be selling it a uh, view i mean you have to be careful because they're selling it for free okay so this is why you should be alerted you know imagine you go to a mall and say that ye aap joote leke jao free mein you know you will think 20 times ki nahi nahi lene ka hai we rukte hain sochte hain kya ho raha exactly you ask the setup first ki boss what is the uh, what is the small print there okay so i think it i mean i just love the the this disintermediation where so many people and my favorites are all there on on social media and actually you know it's unbelievable that you know i can actually listen to the greats uh, without getting this intermediated by tv channels and anchors this is absolutely amazing thing you know it's never happened in the past you know imagine buddha and mahavir would have been there telling on twitter that aisa karo meditation you know this is the greatest good at least as far as i am concerned i have experienced and yet i have to tell you that you know who is exactly the buddha because there are million buddhas claiming themselves to be buddha you know that filtration process has to be in place you know with you so as it is right you know um, dj it's the, the 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 in the end there there is there are a lot of view shops you ought to be careful about picking the right shops who to rely the best that social media offers actually is not the comment by the great but actually the the guy who is questioning it again and when the two guy, two greats actually uh, sort of fight with each other on twitter is or or linkedin or wherever that is the best setup you know this that's where the truth can be extracted in my view so uh, this is unbelievable good truth uh, unbelievable good but double edged and the gullible would actually lose money but they always lose money in this form or other you know they will always lose money so it's not a new thing okay so the other question which i have for you manish is about the regulations which are hitting the mutual fund industry we have seen so many of regulations which have come in I and mean, at the time by the time you would have also left there were many which were in place and now more and more have come in so i mean the plethora of regulation which have come in do you think so it, from a from a ideological again perspective i have this question in the sense that india is again as you said we are poor country okay do we have the Uh, means so there are certain regulation which need to be there definitely but there are certain regulation which are costly which are mundane so do you think that we are at the right economic cycle to have all the regulations all the time and 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 uh, you must have read all the regulation you must be uh, up to them one of the things which again uh, again a uh, extension to this question probably a specific one to this regulation is that something like corporate bond market liquidity is something which we have it's a kind of a chimera which we have seen it we, we have not achieved that corporate bond market liquidity can it happen by regulations or do you think that it will take uh, its due course and liquidity will happen over a period of time so this these are my questions over to you manish no corporate market liquidity is like enlightenment it it's good to have but it never happens anywhere almost anywhere so it's in a sense see the problem as i said you know in the beginning i made this point that intrinsic in a corporate bond particularly of a lower quality ones is that the refinance risk and business risk cannot be separated their intermingling happens there which inherently makes corporate bonds uh, much riskier in lower rated ones then what they are okay especially on uh, in the bond format in loan format it doesn't and which is why europe's experience and uh, with respect to this has been different than that of us which has gone through bond crisis so many times of course now it's same everywhere so I'm, my sense is that this is something that we all love to have because this is how to parcel 
what do you call it credit risk uh, and distribute it but then you know it's not possible in my view because of the reasons that i mentioned so and can regulation help this of course you know you i mean what is india's corporate bond market is primarily psu bonds you know now that's not corporate bond that's pretty much gavi government bonds there is no corporate bond market in india you know all the claims that there is a corporate bond market liquidity development is essentially hiding the very truth that you know what's being liquid today and you know what how it anchors all the participants is important right it anchors all the participants to the extent to wherever the liquidity lies is where the franchises you know sit so all the mutual funds have become pretty much psu bond shops okay so in a sense we all are in the same party now and and basically the the very thing which which what requires a liquid uh, what do you call uh, bond market is we all are ready to say no to that in any case so which is why a lot of shops have come up you know which are actually now now offering the credit directly to the uh, to the individual balance sheet you know it's it's a tragedy you know people ought to understand this you it, the 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 only way you can extract good from the credit is when you have participation in in many of them together as a portfolio irrespective of what you know of the firm owning one or two or three or five or 10 firm in a portfolio especially in credit it is catastrophic you know it it cannot it does not sit with the very idea of how financial instruments behave so in a sense when we shut the shops in open ended mutual fund platform the steam now is being passed on to the individual investors directly anyone who thinks and apply mind to it you know for long enough will realize that no it's untenable for individual investors because the whole idea is you know right you know which is why i am against this very idea of investing in uh, five stocks three stocks portfolio concentrated bets markets offer to you dj and you know it of course but to everyone markets offer to you is that it will offer risk premium if you invest in markets it does not offer the same if you invest in a company the risk of ruin or risk of catastrophe is so outsized disproportionate to the returns that you will get that it makes no rational sense to invest in a company irrespective of your view on that so equity markets offer risk premium only when you invest in markets which is like 50 companies 60 companies you know unrelated uh, relatively uncorrelated portfolio that is when you get extract out 5 6% so which the same thing credit is uh, credit scrutosis is even higher so the fat tails on both sides are so thick the and you know are so frequent they invariably every third or fifth year you will meet with an accident where if you are having only five names in a in a portfolio and one blows up it's over you know your 10 years 10 15 years of excess spread have gone so yeah i'm rambling here but i'm making a point of dj that the solution to that is not direct selling to hnis which you know a lot of folks are now wanting to do because it's a great business it seems no the solution is perhaps in alternate fund platforms which are long ones which is 5 year 7 year 10 year ones and attracting lot of patient capital from people diversifying across 20 30 40 credits uh, in uncorrelated uh, sort of uh, segments also won't uh, won't a higher capital uh, allocation limit in the sense that uh, you have a minimum say a one lakh if you put one lakh at least one lakh you see if you are a sensitive investor you would at least look at where you are putting your money in credit for example a credit kind of absolutely fund. one lakh is too low i mean i think it should be i i mean i understand lower. but from a retail perspective when you are talking uh, i mean i understand what you are saying but particularly from a fixed income perspective one lakh is uh, nothing at this point in time and you are rightly said that uh, it is mostly owned by uh, uh, hnis ultra hnis if you look at yeah, it yeah yeah no i only want to you know i only want retail investor because there is something called equity see what is credit credit is a bridge between high rated bonds and and uh, residual exposure of equity it's a bridge okay so only for sophisticated investors you know when they want to ladder it you know that okay some equity some midpoint some some psus and so on and so forth 
for an average investor i think the best course of action will be simply do the barbell of what do you call fixed income so, triple a manish i have to the- button here uh, sorry but i think we are running out of time so i'll just take some questions uh, fast from our members okay and uh, see uh, uh, what you have to answer on that uh, given the fact this question comes from ravi parekh uh, given the fact the us bond market is witnessing high volatility with spikes in short term yield and decline in long term yield the yield curve is flattening what are prediction on the us 10 to year spreads which has declined significantly in the last 6 months and at this rate we are staring at an inversion in the next 6 months do you predict an inversion in the us given brazil is already <laughs> inverted if yes what could be the repercussion on the global and the indian equity markets i mean generally inverted yield curves especially in us and developed market more specifically us a hint at problem ahead for you as far as your economic growth is concerned and invariably you know that's not good for risk assets so what is surprising is that even before fed has begun to tighten the curves have actually flatlined and that basically suggests that market's confidence especially bond market which one must trust you know more than any other market uh bond market's confidence on global growth and us growth is 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 not not quite much. low yeah okay the other question comes from mr raj tanna does do you use shorting techniques to express negative views in macro investing no i mean one key lesson again people who understand math and financial markets will understand that shorting real assets be particularly uh, equity should never be done because hypothetically at least you know equity can equity price can go up infinitely at least it can go to the extent that it will make you bankrupt whereas the downside is only zero so to that extent on on assets such as this which has inherently you know expansionary assets so to say because earnings help them expand you know uh, one shouldn't short the opposite is the case with bond that bond is a is a reasonable shorting asset class because especially in india you know is more often than not that you know bonds will actually sell uh and in good times they do sell and it's also a good hedge so to say so so i think you know bond could be sort of a good shorting asset class so to say if you want to do it okay uh, this question is a mira shiva if one was to do top down macro investing what are the tools and factors one can use yeah give me a call on this you know but yeah i mean <laughs> yeah i mean you know i put out some sort of stuff outside but i will i'm i, I keep writing uh uh on you know i have a substack and i have linkedin and stuff like that so i over next 8 10 months 12 months i'll put out pretty much the whole framework out what everything that i do but in a format that people can read instead of longish format but yeah basically you know every tool that i i use you know i i sort of want to put it out in public domain so that you know there can be argument on both sides so that i myself can improvise but yeah i mean i i so i i shall do that and you know let's stay connected on that okay manish uh, before we wrap up i mean i think uh, i would like to ask you one last question and what is what is what is one single thing which drives you i mean at this point in time in your career what is one single thing which drives you i mean i i i mean it's very difficult but if i were to write at the top of the desire hierarchy <laughs> that i have the right at the top sits the uh intellect or intellectual sort of rigor i mean i mean if if i would rather be nietzsche than than bill gates and you know I, i'm much farther so much far from both that it, it the distance seems same so yeah i mean it's sort of intellectual rigor and you know the can i build ideas of 
world, you know, in my own way, instead of simply being copycat, applying, you know, science of science to investing and investing to science and and it's a sort of medley in sorts. So yeah, I mean, that's what I think, you know, drive me. I mean, it's fun to speculate on everything in the world. I think a monotonous world doesn't serve well to anybody. I think that that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, so I mean, I think in 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 the wrap up, what I got from um, just to wrap up what Manish was saying, if I'm right, so Manish, you can correct me in between if you if I'm uh, conveying any of your views wrong. I mean, what I think is Manish is uh, negative on equities at this point in time. He is uh, looking at even in on bonds, it looks like Manish is not. Uh, uh, positive because he thinks that uh, uh, policy makers will be against bonds in some time and they will have to act sooner than later that what it looks like and uh, I, I, I because of paucity of time I couldn't get a currency view but I think again he said that currency is strongly intertwined with the interest rate outlook so clearly what we are going to see is some amount of weakness in the rupee clearly because of the supply demand deficit this is what I think I could get from Manish's indirect view on the currency as well. This is just a point, you know, I think, you know, people make this point that cash is trash, you know, far too often and people don't understand, you know, only the only people who know markets well understand that it's unfortunate that it's being popularized by many. Cash is not trash. It comes with so much optionality of actually being able to do with your money, updating your thinking models and market models next morning. So at this stage, given uncertainties around, I've been extremely big chairer of Indian equities and world equities from March end 2020 until August. I think it makes sense to be underweight equities given what's playing out in terms of uh, policy turbulence and growth scare that I expect. It makes sense for you to be overweight cash. Uh, it, the money is not made again as a matter of fact where your money has does not have to work every day exact uh, same amount it only it comes in episodes and when when big jab Lakshmi knock karti hai, that day you should have a lot of money to deploy and give it to her you know instead of you know that roj, roj mujhe taka, taka banana hai. it doesn't happen like that yeah but nonetheless yeah <laughs> So I think uh, uh, very aptly put by uh, Manish, his views and very concisely and in detail as well, what he thinks about the markets currently. I think uh, wonderful money having you here on this platform. I think our members would have benefited out of this. Whoever is listening to this webcast would have benefited out of this. I think your views are uh, something which uh, they will go back and ruminate on and uh, think about. I think uh, investment is a line which is i think for everyone and even if you are not there in this uh, profession it is something which you have to do uh, as a matter of fact so i think uh, uh, a very big thank you uh, for joining us and uh, sharing your views on this platform thanks a lot thanks a lot manish thank you dj Uh, over to you, Vijay. Vijay, you are on mute, Vijay. Thank you, thank you, Manish and uh, uh, Vijendra, for this uh, brilliant discussion. Uh, I think it's much more than what I bargained for uh, in that one hour. Just brilliant. <laughs>